So good morning. Um, I will be now starting the session and uh, thank you for registering for this uh, PISO MEMS um, service that we are launching today uh, from Tyndall. This is a webinar on that. It's the last in the series. We started on the 24th of March and we are concluding today. That's the 5th of May and uh, today is the talk on Tyndall's new PISO MEM services, in particular for SAW applications. I would like to uh, introduce you to my two co-panelists, uh, Dr. Romano from IMEC, and he's here to help us resolve all the doubts that you all have on Europractice services. Please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box uh, regarding your uh, queries on your practice services. This can be general services other than the MEM service as well. I also have with me my co-panelist, Dr. Sambuddha Khan, and uh, he's also from the Tyndall National Institute Ireland as me. And together with him, I will be able to resolve all your doubts and queries on the Tyndall's PISO MEM service. So even regarding this, if you have any doubts and you want clarifications, please, please feel free post your questions in the Q&A box. And uh, let me start. So basically, uh, today's talk is concentrating on the Tyndall service. And what we have from uh, Tyndall is the PISO MEMS service and it is for SAW application. And I will be taking you through a journey of SAW devices. So I will tell you what SAW means, what the SAW device structure looks like, the principle of working of this device, then get into the applications, then give you the insight into the service that we have from the PISO MEMS group at Tyndall. And this is basically, we are also launching this offer today on Europractice. And then finally, I'll be taking you through the different services that we have from Europractice. So what is a SAW device? SAW stands for Surface Acoustic Wave. And as the name suggests, it's a wave on the surface of a particular substrate. And in this case, it's the piezoelectric substrate or the piezoelectric film. But it has a material stack which plays an important role. So a saw device basically will have a substrate. Typically what we see in literature is a silicon substrate, but there are other kinds of substrates as well being used for a different kind of application. On top of the substrate, we have the piece of film. And this piece of film again has on top of it a metal layer. The metal layer is patterned to create these interdigitated electrodes. Now, the piezo film is, as per literature, if you see, there are a variety of materials that are used for this piezoelectric film or the substrate. If you see literature, there is lithium neobate, aluminum nitride, ZNO, lithium tantalate, and so on. So depending on the kind of application that you're looking for, you choose a particular material. Also, in a similar fashion, you have different materials for the metal electrode that's been used. And you can see uh, in literature, aluminum being used, gold, platinum, molybdenum, and so on. And as I go deeper into the physics of this device, you will know which material to choose for what kind of application. So typically what happens is uh, when you pattern these uh, interdigitated electrode, you pattern it in this fashion with a probing uh, pad area. And um, once you probe them with an RF signal, a wave is created. And this wave looks like this that you see at the bottom here, which has some streaming action where it actually propagates on the surface of the piezoelectric film in a particular fashion. So there are a uh, few waves which go in the longitudinal direction, few waves which goes on the transverse direction and so on. So what you see here on your top right corner is the same image of one of the earliest devices that we have been able to fabricate at Tyndall. This is not an optimized process yet, but we are in the process of getting it optimized. So let's uh, understand the physics of generation of surface acoustic wave using a saw device. So if you see a saw device from the top, it'll look like this. 
So what we have is an interdigitated electrode. So how does a wave get created? So to create the waves or generate the waves rather, you apply a RF signal, a signal and a ground probe is provided. You apply the RF signal. And once you do that, the first phenomena that happens is basically the inverse piezoelectric effect, whereby this electrical signal is generating a mechanical displacement or a vibration to these electrodes. And those electrodes in turn will actually be generating some vibrations on the piezo film. And once we know that once the piece of film is vibrating or there's some displacement happening, there is a wave that gets created. There are two types of waves, basically one which goes in the bulk and one which is on the surface. And for the saw device, what we are dealing with will be only the surface wave and that is of importance to us. Now these waves, so what is the wavelength at which it travels? And uh, what is the frequency? Uh, and what is the power? All these things depend on the design of these IDT, basically the length, the width, the aperture, the type of material that you use, the piezoelectric material, the type of metal that you use, and so on. So all it's a combined factor which determines basically the wavelength of the signal which you will be trying to generate. So it's, it's a uh, design configuration and the material parameters which create losses and we are, which also create the strength required for the propagation of this saw device. So what you see here is basically the side view of the same structure. So these are the IDTs. And as I said, uh, the wavelength depends on how you design or space out these uh, uh, tooth uh, of the IDTs and you get the standing wave of the saw signal. So having understood now the physics, let me take you into some applications. And one of the applications of saw lies in what we call as saw streaming. So what is saw streaming is to be understood. So saw, when it gets actuated, when the interdigitated electrodes gets actuated, as I said, a wave gets created. So this wave travels on the surface. And when it is traveling on the surface, let's say, we come across a particular droplet of a liquid. Now this liquid now will get energized by the refraction of this wave inside the liquid droplet. And when it gets energized, and if the energy provided for it is sufficient enough for it to start jetting out, or let's say it to get liberated from the substrate, then we have a different kind of phenomena. And this, phenomena of getting liberated from the substrate is used in many medical applications and for jetting applications. But what basically happens is there is a lot of streaming action within this droplet, a lot of energy that gets circulated. Now, if the saw is coming from the left-hand side, there will be an anti-clockwise streaming action. If it comes from the right, there will be a clockwise streaming action and so on. This phenomena is, is happening. And it is used in a variety of applications, not just for medical application that I said. For, for some other application that I'm going to take you through, as you can see here, this is a coffering effect. So the coffering effect is found to be uh, of a nuisance to people or to the researchers who are doing spray coating, let's say of an organic polymer, which uh, is actually a combination of nanoparticles inside the organic polymer. Now, typically in spray coating they, coating, they want it to have a uniform deposition across this area. But what happens is when there is a contact angle, when there is a contact of the droplet at a particular area, the evaporation of that liquid happens at that contact point. And when that evaporation happens, there is a, a mass a gradient because of which the nanoparticles inside this particular uh, 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 inside this particular mixture will get deposited at this point, that is a contact angle point of the droplet. And thereby it leaves a stain when the droplet gets evaporated and there is no uniform deposition of this nanoparticle in this area. And this is an unwanted effect because as you can see, it leaves like a stain of a coffee. Now, how do you make sure that there is uniform deposition of these nanoparticles in, in this given area? One way of doing that is by energizing these nanoparticles 
to spread across. And this energy is provided by the saw streaming action. So if you made this droplet come in contact with a saw wave, the nanoparticles within this droplet will start moving, will get energized. They won't be uh, depositing themselves to the corners. They will go across, as you can see in the figure B and C, and finally in D where the nanoparticles have got deposited uniformly and thereby it reduces this coffee ring effect, which is very much important uh, for the people who work on spray coating of uh, organic uh, uh, nanoparticles. Going further to understand some more applications of the saw device, uh, we need to understand the concept of delay line. So delay line basically is when you use two interdigitated electrodes on top of your piece of film, and the delay line is basically the distance between these two electrodes. So here what is happening is one of your interdigitated electrode is basically your transmitter where you are actuating it with a signal and ground to generate the saw wave. The saw wave travels and at the receiver end, so this second electrode that we have is basically a receiver. One of the electrode here is floating and it does your sensing action. So if there is no particle, if it does not come across any obstacles in its path of propagation, the saw wave is a, a reference signal that is received at the receiver. Now, if you look at your right hand side, during its propagation, if it com comes across some particles, as in this case, it's a bioenzyme that is being um, absorbed at the surface. When it comes across these kind of particles, the saw wave will get reflected or refracted and it will be out of phase when it reaches the sensing electrode and thereby you can sense the amount of concentration that goes into this particular uh, area that the bio uh, sensing area is available. So this is how sensing happens using a saw device. So that's exactly what I want to now look into. A saw sensor can be used as a biosensor if we put in the delay line a sensitive layer which adsorbs a particular biomolecule, it becomes a biosensor. If the sensitive layer is say sensitive to a particular gas molecule, then it will adsorb the gas molecules and it becomes a gas sensor. So for different kinds of sensing action, the saw sensor can be saw device can be used and you can design it accordingly. Going further, saw device can also be used in many other applications. One of them is as a RFID reader and as a, a, a sensor or a device which can be used in wireless application, which does not require a battery. So how does this happen is, we can see here there is a reader unit. So it generates uh, a particular RF signal, which is transmitted using the antenna the IDP basically will get actuated and once it gets actuated, the saw signal is generated or the saw wave is generated. It propagates and it hits these metal strips, which we call as reflectors. Once it hits these metal strips or the reflectors, it gets reflected back and it gets reflected back in a way depending on the spacing of these metal strips or the reflectors. So as it gets reflected back, it is resensed by the same IDT, which is now receiving the signal, and then it wirelessly transmits it. Now, you can generate a unique RFID uh, code using different kinds of designs of the IDT and different kinds of designs of the reflected reflectors, that is the reflector bank. So you get an RFID reader using the saw structure. Also, since it is on a piezoelectric film, it does not require a battery. It self generates its own energy and it can be used in these wireless sensor applications. Going further, a saw device can also be used in your RF applications as resonators. So we know uh, resonators are required in the tank circuit for many of the RF applications and you see a variety of uh, saw resonators here. The first resonator that you see here is a one port resonator without any reflector. The second one is a one port resonator with reflectors on either side. The third one that you see is a two port reflect or a resonator 
without the reflector. And this is a two port resonator with the reflectors. Now, what kind of frequency it generates, how, it, how much it propagates, what's its strength, all depends on how you design these uh, one port or two port devices, the, uh, the spacing of the IDTs, the length, the width, and also please remember, as I said, especially for RF, you should be careful about the material that you choose, the piezoelectric material, the metal, the thickness of these film, all play a very significant role in getting you very high frequency resonators. So this is the top view of this device. And what you see now on your right is the side view of the same. So as I said, there is a stack for this and you should be careful about what kind of material you're using. So you have silicon as a substrate, and then you have the aluminum scandium nitride as a piezo layer and platinum as your electrode. And these are spaced in a, a fashion that it is dependent on a function of your wavelength. And that determines basically the frequency that you can generate. And you have to be careful about the design, you have to be careful about the material choose, especially for RF applications. Now taking you further, to some more applications, uh, we can use the SAW device even as a strain sensor. Typically what we see uh, a MEMS strain sensor will have uh, the piezoresistive patches. So you have a long cantilever and you will put the piezoresistive patch exactly in the space where you fix the cantilever and where you get the maximum strain. In a similar fashion here, what, we, what they have done is the cantilever is a, a long cantilever and you're placing the saw device, which has a reflector bank, such in a such a nice way designed that it gives you a particular unique frequency when there is no strain. And as soon as the cantilever moves and there is a strain, the, this reflector bank will have its uh, tilting action. Thereby, what will happen is the signal that will be sent back to the receiver antenna will have a different kind of frequency and a different code gets generated. So when you compare the reference signal with your uh, changed signal on application of a strain, you can make it work as a strain sensor. Now, taking you further, it can also be used as a liquid sensor. So what we see here is typically a single IDT. As I said, it generates saw wave on either side of the IDT. On one side, you just have a simple reflector it will travel, hit these metal strips, get reflected back. And it, that is your reference signal because there is no hurdle coming across here. But on the other side, we have a sensing area where you'll have your liquid droplet or the liquid that needs to be sensed placed in the sensing area. And when the surface acoustic wave hits this area, it will get reflected back, which will be out of phase with your reference signal thereby you can tell that this much amount of liquid was present and it works as a liquid sensor. So what I've taken you through right now is a variety of applications that uh, we have in SAW, but I would like to say this is not the limit that you can use the SAW devices. There are plenty more applications. Please look at the literature and you will find much, much more. So now let me introduce you to the Tyndall's piezo mem service. As I speak to you, this is the launch of the two modules from Tyndall. The first module that we have is the single electrode layer stack. This, this particular stack is an eight inch wafer stack. What we have is a silicon substrate, which is 725 micron in thickness. It's P-type dope. Its orientation is 100. Its resistivity is one to 50 ohm centimeter. We have in this particular stack an option of having the thermal oxide layer of one micron thickness. It is optional. If you do not require this liquid layer, we can also uh, eliminate it in your stack. On top of this, we have the aluminum scandium nitride. That's the piezoelectric material we are providing. Its thickness is also one micron. It's on C plane to give you good piezoelectric values. And the top electrode is molybdenum and it is two, 50 nanometer in thickness. And as I said, uh, this is an eight inch wafer and it is not patterned. It's just the material stack for your post-processing in your foundries. It can be used in a variety of applications. If you have the post uh, foundry process, it can be used in optics, RF, 
uh, it can be used in uh, many other applications, medical applications, all the applications that I've listed out there can be actually uh, done using this particular stack, provided you have the post-processing facility at your place. So in Europractice, we are launching this service. The Europractice academic prize is 1,100 euro per wafer. Please feel free to contact me for any further details. The second uh, module that we are launching today from Europractice is the dual electro layer stack. Again, it's an eight inch wafer. We have the standard silicon of 725 micron thickness with a P-type dopant orientation 100 resistivity is one to 50 ohm centimeter. Here, the thermal oxide layer is not optional. It is mandatory and is one micron in thickness. And aluminum scandium nitride, that's a piezoelectric film, is now sandwiched between the top and bottom molybdenum electrode. The electrodes are 250 nanometer in thickness. It's an eight inch wafer. Again, there is no patterning. It's for you to take these wafers and do the post-processing at your place. So it's a academic price from Europractice will be at 1,250 euro per wafer. And again, I would request you to get back to me with any of your queries, or you can put it in the Q&A box as I speak to you. The third module, which we are not launching today, but we will be doing so very shortly, is the SAW device module. So it's the same standard stack, which has only one molybdenum electrode on top, but this electrode will now get patterned as per the design of the SAW device that you will be submitting to us. This will be launched very shortly and it will be launched on your practice in the MPW process. It can be a cost-effective solution and you can bring out your low and medium scale volume production using this service. This is still under process. We are still optimizing it. And once we have it ready, we will launch it on the Europractice platform. I would like to share some characterization results from our foundry. This is our XRD image. And the D33 that, uh, value that we have is six picocoulomb per Newton. And it's measured from our piezometer PM300. The same images of our, our stack is also shown for your reference. This is of a single electrode layer stack, and this is for the dual electrode layer stack. Going further with our results, we have the EDX measurement, and I would like to state that in the aluminum scandium nitride, the scandinium is 6.5 atomic percentage that we are offering. This is our standard service and some of the same image of the earliest devices that have been fabricated in Tyndall is shown here. As I said, we are not launching the service today. We are in the process of optimizing it. And shortly we'll come up with the MPW process and we'll have your design rules specified for it as well. Now I have introduced you to Tyndall service. Now let me introduce you to the various services that we have from Europractice. And as this is our concluding webinar in the MEMS uh, series. So Europractice is your one-stop shop solution for all your fabrication needs of semiconductor devices. So the, our main concentration will be right now to uh, address your fabrication concerns. But yes, fabrication cannot happen without you understanding the design tools. So we provide you service on the design tools as well. So please feel free to contact us on fabrication and on design tools. Now to understand how these design tools work and how you can use it, we provide training for you on that as well. Also, we have continuously some webinars going on as in this case that you're attending. This is the last concluding session of the MEMS webinar. So for the fabrication needs, we have lined up a list of foundries that you can see here for the ASICs. The top foundries are for the ASIC devices. We have a host of foundries up lined up for you there. On the MEMS side, we have covered all the foundry services as part of this webinar series. We have MEMSCAP, XFAB, and today Tyndall is joining that and we are offering you service from Tyndall as well. On the photonic side, again, in the middle that you see here at the uh, middle bottom, you have again a line of different foundries who are going to help you with the photonics devices, as well on the microfluidics, we have two fab lines opened up for you. 
please feel free again to contact us for any of your queries on these foundries for any of your applications. As I said, we also offer uh, on the MPW service, MPW is a multi-project wafer service where on a single wafer, we'll have designs of different customers. This reduces the cost drastically for the customer and you can come up with the small and medium sized volume production. Very soon, Tyndall will join the service as well. But right now itself, you have uh, a list of foundries who are offering you the service through your practice. If you visit our website, you will be able to see the schedule of these MPW runs, the costing of the different foundries, and uh, you can approach us with any queries. Also on the CAD tools, we have again lined up a series of CAD tools, depending on what kind of research you are doing. Uh, we have non-commercial licenses for European Academia that we have listed out here and we provide you training on these services as well. So please feel free to contact us again for any of these services. So training and webinars are our constant goal and aim to see that we reach out to the academia, PhD students and create a strong practical session for them. Due to the COVID restrictions, we have also gone online and we hope you can take um, this service uh, to your advantage. Also, we uh, keep conducting the webinars, as I said, this is the concluding part of the MEMS webinar, but we also have had webinars on advanced photonic packaging, on microfluidics, silicon photonics, and all the recordings of all these webinars are put up on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it. Going further, Europractice also has a system integration service so to understand what we have on system integration, we have come up with the virtual demo platform on our website. So if you go there and click on say one of these modules, let's say the wafer level fan out, if you click here, it will take you to a page which will list out the kind of system integration service we have for our wafer level fan out or for high speed RF connectors or on MEMS and so on. So it is important that you can understand the system integration service and that's the reason we have come up with this virtual demo platform uh, for your understanding. And also if you have any queries, again, please post to us. But what one needs to understand is before you go into system integration service, it's very important to package your device well and packaging of device will happen if you understand the design rules of packaging and incorporate those design rules well in advance during your uh, design phase itself of the device. And to understand the packaging rules of your uh, devices, we have come up with this design rule handbook or the toolbox. And if you download uh, this particular uh, document, which exists on our website, you will be getting the design rules, let's say for die size geometry or for arrangement of RF bond pads and so on. It's important you read these uh, details, understand them, incorporate them, in your design phase itself. It um, creates a lot of uh, healthy uh, environment for you to understand system integration and not just come up with just a device fabrication. We are available on social media and uh, basically on uh, YouTube as well as LinkedIn. If you follow us on LinkedIn, you'll get our regular updates. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will get notification as and when we post any recorded videos. So please subscribe to YouTube and please follow us on LinkedIn. Today, as I said, we are launching the Tyndall's Europractice uh, service and it's going live on the website. So we are um, announcing the single electrode layer stack. If you click on the expand button, you will be getting more details, which I have showcased now. And you will be also led to the access information page where you will get the email ID through which you can contact me. Please feel free to contact me as we launch this service. I would now like to acknowledge all the partners of Europractice without whom this would have been impossible for us to conduct. So IMEC uh, is in Belgium and Romano is uh, present here to uh, address all the uh, queries that we have from Europe practice. There are many people um, who have uh, gone uh, in the uh, background, they have worked for launch of this service, as well as for this webinar. I need to thank every one of them. There is a CMP from uh, France, Fraunhofer from Germany, UKRI from UK, 
and of course Tyndall from where I belong. Each and every partner has played an important role in coming up with this webinar series and for all the services that you see in your practice. And last but not the least, I would like to thank the PISO MEMS group as well as the Europe Practice group from Tyndall. Uh, and I'm very proud and privileged to be part of both the groups. And if not for the help of these people, I would not have been able to launch this offer or also um, help you uh, with the queries that is being quest uh, questioned here. And uh, that's it.